Amen. Well, good morning again. If you have a Bible with you, I'd invite you to open it with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. 1 Corinthians 15 will be in verses 50 through 58 as we finish up uh, 1 Corinthians 15, this chapter, um, and finish up this uh, short sermon series uh, that we have uh, entitled Resurrection Results as we have looked at uh, the Apostle Paul's defense of the resurrection of people, of the resurrection of Jesus, and also the results of that, what we have, the hope that we have because Jesus was resurrected. Um, and today, in this last part of this chapter, uh, Paul does a couple of things through the inspiration of the Spirit. One, he gives one final result, uh, one final thing, that, one final answer that to question that may be lingering in some people's minds or maybe even being shared to him. Um, and then he also, uh, I think this is important too, he also gives us um, some practical things that, that we can do here and now. Because a lot of the things that Paul has been talking about has been about, well, you know, this is what happens after you die, or this is what happens, uh, you know, uh, at the return of Jesus. And we'll see some of that uh, today. But he wraps this chapter up saying, because Jesus has been resurrected, and because you have hope, this is how you should live. This is how you should be. Yeah, the light's annoying, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not sure which one that is, but um, yeah, that's going to be fun. Nothing. I already have enough glare off my head, now I have a flashing glare <laughs> off of my head. That's really helpful. So anyway, um, we'll be again in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 58. Let's read that together. God's perfect an inspired word says this. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruption has put on incorruption, or when the corruptible has put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so in verse 50, in the first part of 51, he reiterates some things that we've already learned, but, but some important truths. In verse 50, he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. And so what we see is him reiterating this idea that in order to be uh, bodily in heaven for eternity with Jesus in the presence of God, that there, we, those who have died are going to have to have a different body. He's going to give us a new flesh. This flesh and blood, this, these earthly bodies, these terrestrial bodies, if you will, uh, if you look up in verse 40, he already talks about this. He says there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is one. In other words, these bodies that we live and dwell in now are not created for eternity. They're not created for heaven. They're not created for being in the presence of God. And so the, these, this flesh and blood with these bodily functions that we have, that we are relying on, he says that those will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those will not enter into the kingdom of God. And again, that's something that we have we have already talked about because these bodies are corrupted. Uh, they're created by, by or for the earth, and they're corrupted by sin and by the curse of sin. And so they're not created for eternity in heaven. And in verse 51, he says something interesting. He said, but I tell you a mystery. Because if we read all of this chapter in context, and we've been trying to do that, that's what we do here, this creates a question. It creates a question that is yet to be answered. It, it, there's a bit of a mystery. Uh, my grandfather used to say when something, he would just say, oh, well, that's, that's a mystery, you know? And, 
That's, there's, there's a mystery laid here. And, and we might miss it if we don't go back and read um, a couple of verses. Look back in verse 23 and 24 of chapter 15. It says, But each one in his own order, speaking of resurrection, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, and when he delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, and puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. So in these verses, Paul tells us very clearly that there will be a day when Jesus is going to return. Do we believe that? That there'll be a day that Jesus is going to return. We don't know exactly when that day is or how far off we are from that day, but we do know that there's going to be that Je- a day that Jesus returns. So if we understand that Jesus is coming back and we understand that there will be those, if you look again um, in verse 23, it says, but each one of those in his own order, Christ the first fruits, listen to this, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. And so there will be some people at the coming of Christ who will still be alive, right? There will be people who are still alive when Christ comes. There will be believers who are still alive when Christ comes. And so the question is this, if Christ is coming and there will be people who are his at that time, but those bodies are not able to inherit the kingdom of God, what about those people, right? Because we've already established that those who are dead in Christ, they will rise, they will be transformed, they will be given a new body, a heavenly body, a celestial body, they will, be, they will become more like Jesus, they, they will have that eternal body, right? We've already established that, so we know what happens to those who are dead in Christ when Christ returns. But the question is, what happens to those who are alive in Christ when Christ returns? And so Paul, again, we talked about this last week, Paul being... The, the great debater, if you will, answers this question. He says, I'm going to tell you this mystery. Now, w- when the Bible in the New Testament sp- uses this word mystery, when he speaks of this, this isn't something that, that he, he's not saying he has figured this out. This isn't something that we need to figure out. This idea of a mystery is just sim- simply something that is yet to be um, illuminated by God. It's yet to be told. Right? So there just wasn't any way for us to know this unless God revealed it. And so what Paul is saying is that God has revealed this to me, this truth, through the inspiration of the Spirit, and I'm going to share it with you. So he's not proclaiming that he somewhere how has figured this out. He's just proclaiming that God, in his time, has now revealed this truth. And so he goes to answer this question. So the answer to the question is found in verses 51 through 53. Look with me there. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, in other words, not all be dead, but shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And so he says, at the end, at that last trumpet, when Christ returns in his public return, whenever he does that, that the dead in Christ are going to rise but he says that they're not the only ones who are going to experience a change. He says that we all will be changed. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17, it's described this way. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so he says in that moment, there will be a change. It will not be just those people who have died in Christ, but we too, he's saying, the the group who are still alive when Jesus returns, they will have a new life as well or a new body as well. Now we need to understand something about this because... Um, he says in verse 51, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And so it sounds like Paul is saying, well, I'm going to be one of those people who are going to see the coming of the Lord. And, and there would be some theologians and that, that would say that Paul just believed that, that he believed that the Lord was coming in his lifetime and that he thought he was going to see the coming 
of the Lord. That, that just because he's inspired to write scripture, he isn't all-knowing, he doesn't know all things, God didn't reveal everything to him, and so therefore um, he didn't know that. And maybe that's true, but I think more, more likely what he's talking about when he talks about we is he's talking about we as a group of people. That there are, remember, there are orders of people. There are those who are, who are non-believers. There are those who are believers. Those who are saved and those who are not saved. And he's grouping them together. If you look in verse 50, look who he's talking to. Now, I say, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood. Remember, he's talking to the brethren here. He's talking to the church. And so he's talking about there will be some in the church those who are saved, those who are redeemed, there will be some of those who will be alive at that time. And so that's the grouping that he's speaking of whenever he does this. But he says that they're all going to be changed. All of us will be changed. Those who are dead in Christ and those who are alive at his coming. Look with me again in verses 52 and 53. It says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Just like we talked about last week, I can't tell you exactly um, how you're going to look um, in your resurrected body, what your resurrected body will look like. I don't, I don't know about the color of your hair or any of those sorts of things, or if you even have any. We talked about the possibility that everybody will be bald in perfection or whatever, right? So we just don't know. We don't know exactly how that's going to happen, but he does give us some types of change. First, that change will be instant. It says in verse 52, in the moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that that, that phrase, in the twinkling of an eye, that phrase is faster than a blink. It, it's, 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 more like a, it's more like a twitch. I don't, even know, I don't even know how it can be faster than a blink, but, but it's not even a blink. It's, it's, it's like a twitch. I was thinking about this earlier. Some of you know that I've got these wonderful, you've noticed my wonderful bifocals that I get to wear now. It's, what are you laughing about? It's not funny. But anyway, some are like, oh, look at him. He's old. Yeah, whatever. Uh, and, and so, but, but fortunately, I've been wearing these long enough that my eyes now are trained that as soon as I pick something up, my eyes just instantly go to where they need to go to see what I need to see, right? They just, they, I don't have to think about, now, where do I put my head to read? That's what I was, the first week in my office, I'm sitting there like this in my computer, like trying to figure out where's my head supposed to be, right? And now I just sit there and my eyes go to where they're supposed to be. They just twitch. They just go right there. That's the speed with which he's talking about that this happens. So this change will be an instantaneous change. It's nothing over time. There's no sort of waiting period. There's no sort of purgatory. There's no sort of waiting. It's just boom. When he comes, we change those who are left. Here's the other type of change. It will be instant and it will be incorruptible. In verse 53, for corruptible must put on incorruption, never to be corrupted again. Removed from the sinfulness of the world, removed from the stain of sin in our own lives, completely in the righteousness of Jesus, never to be corrupted again. It will also be immortal. Look in verse 53. Again, this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality, never to die again. Aren't you thankful for that? I, I'm looking forward to that, to that instant, incorruptible, and immortal change. Whether, whether it's coming up from a grave or meeting Jesus in the air, that's good news. That's good news. There, there's hope there. there. There's much hope. So there is a type of change that will happen, that, that we will all be changed. So he answers this question. This is the mystery. Those who are still alive at the return of Jesus, they too will be changed like those who are dead at the return of Jesus, and they will be changed as well. Look with me in verses 54 through 57. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
the final result of this, the final result of the resurrection of Jesus and then the reign of Jesus and then the return of Jesus, the final result of this is that there will be no more sting of death. If you notice in verse 54, it says, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, so when this change happens, when this resurrection happens, when that change happens for those who are still alive when Jesus returns, he says that's when it happens. And, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, this is, this is one of those passages of, of Scripture that, that you've probably heard it before. You've probably heard this part of 1 Corinthians 15, and you probably heard it at a funeral, right? This is one of our, uh, this, is, this is a good funeral verse, right? You've probably heard this verse and, and uh, maybe 1 Thessalonians 4 and so, Psalm 23, there's a lot of the verses that are just common at funerals. What was interesting about this is this really isn't the best funeral verse. Because this, this verse is not promising, promising you that there's no sting of death today. It's promising that there'll be no sting of death then. Because death stings, doesn't it? Death still stings. Death still hurts. Some of us have experienced that even recently, that, that we've experienced loss in friends or family or relationships, and, and it still stings. Even if, it has, even if it's been five years, ten years, we still think about that. And that, that, that death still stings. It still hurts. It still pricks at our heart. There's still, there's still all sorts of these feelings and emotions that come up with that. And so, But he says at that moment, when that happens, there will be no more sting. Here's what's interesting. Here's the good news about this text for us today, that for the believer who is experiencing the loss of a believer, death really is just a sting. For a person who is not a believer, who, or for a person who may be experiencing the loss of a non-believer, death is much more than a sting. It is, it is the worst thing imaginable. It's the worst, most painful loss you could ever come up with in your life. You see, we've probably all had one of those experiences where we've been literally stung, right? Like a bee, a wasp, a hornet, something, and we've been literally stung. Stung. The last time I got stung, I was on a roof. I was walking on a roof, which is a great place to be stung, right? I was walking on this roof, and there was a little hornet's nest up underneath the eave. I didn't know. I was just walking by, and this came out and stung me on my pinky. Just whack, and then flew back in. And, and I was, it, it caught me off guard, and it hurt. And at, in that moment, I was like, oh, that's the worst pain I've ever experienced. Because, you know, I'm a man, and that's how I deal with things, right? And, and, you know, I don't have ever get the man flu or any of those things. And so, like, this is the worst pain I've ever experienced. And it hurt for a while, and my finger kind of swelled up, and it was red. And I couldn't wait for my nurse wife to get home and have compassion on me. Anyway, this wasn't going to happen. But so I, I just kept thinking, oh, I can't wait to show her. You know, she's going to feel so bad. We're going to get some salve on it or something. I don't know what, right? It didn't even hurt by the time she got home. I had a little dot on my finger. It, the pain went away. Did it hurt in the moment? Absolutely, it hurt in the moment. Was it difficult in the moment? Sure it was. But eventually, the pain went away. And even for, uh, for us as believers who have experienced the loss of someone in our family or our friends who are believers, yes, does it hurt in the moment? It, yes, it does. The Bible says there's a time to mourn. You should mourn that. It hurts. But we also know that there's hope. We also know that, that, that there's life, that there's, that there's an opportunity to meet again for those who are believers. There's a reunion waiting. That's good news. And so he says, but even that sting will be gone. He will make all things right. There will be no more death, no more separation, no more suffering. All of that will be completely and totally over. But here it's important for us to know how that happens. He says in verse 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God. 
who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How is that happening? How is that possible that death is swallowed up? How is it possible that it has no more victory? How is it possible that it has no more sting? It's possible by the work of Jesus Christ, by the grace of Almighty God. Amen? That's how it's possible. It comes through him. If you notice in in verse 56, it says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. There are three things in verse 56 that, that causes there to be sting in our lives. First, the sting of death. Death is what stings us. When, when we separated, when we, when we experience loss, there's, there's a sting that happens there. And that sting happens because of sin. Death happens because of sin. And sin happens because there is the law. And the law illuminates that sin. And we're guilty and judged in front of that law. So in order for there to be victory, there has to be victory over death. There has to be victory over sin. And there has to be victory over the law. Good news. Jesus did it all. Jesus won on all three fronts. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In our place, he died for us. He fixes the sting of death. In Romans chapter 6, verses 10 through 11, it says this, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He took care of sin. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, Christ took the curse of the law. All three fronts, death, sin, and law, Jesus is victorious over that. And so our response, our response is so simple. Our response is thanks be to God. Our response is that our hearts would respond in worship, that our hearts would respond in gratefulness, That we would be thankful to him and to him alone because salvation comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. And so that sting of death is removed because of the victory that we have in Jesus. And in that moment, that victory is realized. In that moment, that victory is seen by everyone. It is completed completely. And so Jesus gives us that victory. Because of that victory, there is no more sting in death. Friend, death will sting while we're here. It will continue to sting. In fact, it's supposed to. That's why it's the wage of sin. But good news, there's a day when it will sting no more. The reunion for the believers at that moment will be so much sweeter than the sting of the the separation ever was. The gloriousness of the body that is given to the believer will outshadow the the difficulty of the body at death. So the question then is for us, how do we respond to that today? Is it just something that we know? Is it just is it just facts that we can debate? Some of you are probably already debating in your mind right now about when that return of Jesus will be, right? There's some of you are already thinking about, well, I don't know, maybe it'll be before this or after this, or I think in this, or I think this, but I hope I'm wrong or whatever, right? There, there's already probably some, some debate going on in your mind. So is it just so that we can have debates about when the return of Christ will be? Is it just so that we can have some hope that it won't sting as bad. You know, that doesn't seem like, like a very good reason. Well, I'm just telling you now, it's still going to sting, but it won't later. What does that do for me today, right? How, do, how does that help me today? So what we see is in verse 58. He says, therefore, or again, because of everything that I've written, because of all of the things that you now know about the resurrection of Jesus, about the, all things that, that you know about the hope of a resurrection of a believer, because of all of those things that you know, my beloved brethren, 
be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He says the conclusion of the matter is this. If you're a believer, be steadfast. Be immovable. I love that word, immovable. Do not budge. Now, what is he talking about? What are we not supposed to budge from? Well, obviously, if we're talking about the context of this of these verses and the resurrection of Jesus. Remember, he's answering, he's proclaiming this, he's answering these questions because there are people within the church and certainly people outside of the church who are proclaiming that there is no resurrection. This is what has started this whole conversation. Sometimes we forget that, don't we? Have you ever got into a conversation and then at the end of it you thought, how did we get here, right? Like why, how did we get from, we started here and now we're here right? The whole reason that we're here, the whole reason that we're having this conversation is because there are people who are proclaiming that there is no resurrection, that, that Jesus hasn't resurrected or that his resurrection had, uh, or his return had already come. And so he says, be immovable on the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Be immovable on the, res- on the doctrine of the resurrection of those who are saved. Be immovable on the doctrine of the resurrection of those who are not saved to eternal damnation. Be immovable. Do not flinch on this. Because if you flinch on this, if you, if you begin to move, if you begin to walk backward on the resurrection of Jesus, you've walked backward on your entire salvation. You've walked backward on all of your hope. You've walked backward on everything that, that has created this church to begin with. And so he says, do not move. Be steadfast. Plant your feet on the rock of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that encouraging? That we can do that same thing today? That we don't have to be moved? That we have scripture to hold us up in that? But he tells us to do something else as well. Because I don't know about you, but the older I get, not moving is easier, right? You tell me, don't move. All right. I'm good, right? Especially if I have a place to sit. I can, I can be immovable all day long, right? And physically and, you know, I, I'm also much more, much less uh, agreeable. And so, yeah, I don't have a problem just saying, no, I think you're wrong and I don't care, right? It's, it becomes more easier for me every day. I'm good at that, right? I have a teenager. They'll teach you how to do that. If I don't get one of these from the front row every Sunday, I'm not doing my job. <laughs> Whether it's from one of my kids or my wife, if I, if I haven't done that, I've failed as a, as a pastor. Just whatever. So look what else he says to do. He says to be steadfast, to be immovable, but look what else he says. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Those words are challenging to me right there, right? Always abounding. That, that, that's two things that, to be honest, many of us as, as Christians, I think we could say it probably doesn't um, really uh, describe our life very well. Always? Always means doing it all the time, never stopping, always in the work of the Lord, always serving, always giving, always doing, always caring, always loving. I don't know about you, but sometimes mine is sometimes, part-time. But he says always, and then always abounding. There's a difference between doing and abounding, isn't, isn't there? So I coach uh, a little league baseball team, and uh, they're interesting little dudes. They're uh, 9 and 10 years old, and I coach this little league team, and, and catcher is always the big deal, right? Because it's dangerous. And I've got two kids on, on my team that I'm trying to get to be catcher. And one of them, I say, hey, go get the catcher's gear on. And he does something like this. <laughs> right? Because he doesn't want to be catcher. But there's another, another dude. He's about this tall. 
And man, I tell him, he's like, all right, let's go. And he takes off marching. He's fired up. He's abounding in it. He's ready to go. He's not doing the least. He's doing the most. He's not skating by. He's not trying to just meet the bare minimum requirement. He's going over the top. He's abounding in it. And that is what Paul tells us we should be doing because we have the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we should always abound in the work of the Lord. Here's why this is challenging, more challenging to us today. Because Paul is speaking as a man who is persecuted. Paul is speaking to people who will face persecution. If Paul always abounds in the work of the Lord, it may cost him his life. If Paul always abounds in the work of the Lord, it may cost him his freedom. If these people do it, it may cost them their lives. It may cost them their freedom. If we do it, it just costs some time, some energy, maybe maybe somebody will think we're weird, right? Maybe, maybe someone would even get mad at us. Paul says, you do not move, you do not flinch, and you keep moving forward. Why? Three reasons why. Because you can now work without the fear of death. Paul says, you can keep moving, you can keep abounding in the work of the Lord, Because even if you die, you get a new body one day. And that body is eternal. And so you don't have to fear death. The second reason you can abound in work is because there is a a reward that is waiting for you. There is an eternal reward waiting for you. There is the brightness of the sun and the stars and the moon and all that we talked about. There is an eternal reward for those who continue, who persevere, who continue to do the thing. And here's the last reason why we should abound in the work of the Lord. Because it has eternal consequences. Because it has eternal consequences for you, but it has eternal consequences for the person that you're sharing with. So he says, keep sharing the doctrine of the resurrection. Keep sharing the gospel. Why? Because when we share the gospel, people are called to repentance When we share the gospel, Jesus saves people. And when he saves people, he saves them for eternity. He says, this is the hope that you're sharing with a lost world. This is a hope that you're sharing with those who will not inherit the kingdom of God unless there's a change in their heart. So he says, there's eternal ramifications for the way that we serve. I heard a guy talking one time who's not a believer. I don't know what his official stance is whether he's an atheist or agnostic or i don't really know what his official stance is but i heard him he was asked what do you you think about christians he said he said there's some christians that i have great and the utmost respect for even though i disagree with them and he said well who who are those people he said it's the ones who share their faith But he said, I don't have any respect for those Christians who will never share their faith with me. And he said, why is that? And he said, well, if they really believe that there was a heaven and a hell, if they really love me, don't you think they'd tell me? If they really believe that there were eternal ramifications and consequences for whether we believe in Jesus or we don't, and if they really did love me like they proclaimed, don't you think they'd tell me? It's hard to hear from someone like that, isn't it? So he says, always abounding. Friend, you have the best news to tell your neighbor in the history of the world. You have eternal life-altering news to share. Abound in that. Be steadfast in that. Always 
do that. Let's pray as the worship team comes. Heavenly Father, this morning we come before you today a people who are thankful. We recognize, God, that we could not save ourselves, that we could not gain victory over sin, that we could not fulfill the law by ourselves, that we had to have Jesus. And because you sent him, because you loved us, you sent him. And Jesus came and did the work so that we can have this hope. Father, we're thankful that you have loved us, that you have shown us this grace, that you have given us this mercy. Father, help us to be people who will work toward sharing that. Help us to be people who will love our neighbors well. God, help us to be people who are steadfast in the truth of the word, that we would not walk back, that we would not be shaken, and that we would stand fast on your word and the truth of it. Not for our glory, but for yours. Lord, help us to continue to move forward, to continue to love, to continue to share, to share the hope that comes with the resurrection of Jesus. Father, I pray for anyone in this room today who's yet to experience that moment of salvation. Father, I pray that your spirit would, would invade their, their heart even now. God, that you would draw them to repentance, that you would give them salvation even in this moment. Lord, we love you today. We ask these things in Jesus' perfect name. Amen.